Okay. Uh, good off. Good morning, everyone, or whatever time it is for you, wherever you may be in the world as you watch this. Uh, happy Sabbath to you all. Um, I do want to apologize for the delay. Um, it's uh, entirely my fault, but uh, I know with the time that we have that uh, the Lord will be with us and that this will truly be a blessing to us all. So before we begin uh, with our lesson, we will just have a word of prayer to ask the Lord's blessing. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this time that you've given to us to be able to study your word together. We want to ask, Father, that uh, you may give us um, your spirit, that he may help us to understand what is true. Help us, dear God, as we go through this important prophecy and its relevance to our lives today. We commit our souls into your keeping. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay, so as the, um, the advertisements uh, have been saying, uh, the topic that we are discussing this morning is the wine of Babylon. So in this, in this uh, lesson, in this brief study that we will have together, we'll cover the meaning of that phrase. What is meant by the wine of Babylon? As, and secondly, we're going to look um, briefly as well as, uh, as to how this prophecy, this symbolism, has been fulfilled in history. So our key verse is found in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. This is uh, the verse that contains the second of the three angels' messages, which we know to be the, the final message that is, that is to be given to this world before Jesus comes. So it says in verse 8, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8, it says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <clears throat> so, let's just briefly observe some things from this verse before we move on. Right? The first thing that we learn is that, uh, this, that the church, which is symbolized by the angel, uh, I know we covered that in a previous study, uh, the church is pronouncing that this entity called Babylon is or has fallen. Um, uh, the reason, according to this verse, that Babylon has fallen is because, it says, it has made all nations to drink of its wine. Uh, so, that, in other words, the cause of Babylon's fall, the reason it has fallen, is because it has made nations to drink of this wine. So, and, and we also see from the verse that this wine is described as the wine of the wrath of Babylon's fornication. So, Babylon... Uh, is making the nations drunk, and it is involved in fornication or sexual immorality. <clears throat> so, what exactly is Babylon? So, in our previous studies, because um, that has already been touched on in our previous um, two studies, we're not going to go in depth, we're not going to go into all the verses. There are plenty of verses uh, that discuss this, but we saw last week that Babylon is a, it's a symbolic... Um, description of all the all systems of religious confusion right in revelation particularly it applies to the apostate churches and we'll continue to unravel this as we as we go along i'll just read a statement from the the book the great controversy page 381 paragraph 1 and for those of you who don't know what the book the great controversy is all about it's one of the greatest commentaries or well, the greatest explanation of the unfolding of final events um, that is available uh, to us as Christians today. It traces uh, the history of the church, of the, of the, the Christian church, from, from the period of, the, of Jerusalem's destruction all the way um, up to uh, the end of time. <clears throat> and in its final chapters, it particularly deals with the unfolding of the events as spoken of in the book of um, Revelation, especially chapters 12 uh, through, um, through, through the end. So, um, in, this, in this statement, page 381, paragraph 1, it says, The term Babylon is derived from Babel and signifies confusion. You'll remember in Genesis 11, as we saw last week, that Genesis, uh, in Genesis 11 you have um, essentially the wicked of the earth uh, confederating, coming together, and uh, building a, a tower. And you remember that God confounded them by confusing their languages. And in verse 9 of chapter 11, it says that 
uh, the tower and, and the place got its name because of that very event. So, uh, in other words, if I was to say it simply, Babel just is referring to the confusion that resulted. And so Babylon uh, is just a more, a more a, a different rendering of, um, of Babel. It refers to the idea of confusion. So it's a system of confusion. Um, <clears throat> then it says, it is employed in scripture to designate or to refer to the various forms of false or apostate religion. <clears throat> in Revelation 17, Babylon is represented as a woman. And we're going to look at this a little bit later. As a woman, a figure which is used in the Bible as a symbol of the church. And you remember last time we saw that Paul uses it in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, in Ephesians 5, I think it's verse 25. And th all throughout the Old Testament, the God's people are continually referred to as a woman. Uh, it says, a figure which is used in the Bible as a symbol of a church, a virtuous woman, that is a good woman, a godly woman, a pure woman, representing a pure church, a vile woman representing an apostate church, right? And um, what is obvious is that we've already seen Babylon. Um, it, it says, um, yeah, Babylon is represented as a woman. Therefore, Babylon refers to a church. And we we've already seen in just from verse 8 alone that Babylon is involved in making other nations, all the nations drunk, and she's involved in fornication. So is she a pure woman or as it says here, a vile woman. Obviously, it's the second one. Uh, Babylon is referring to a vile woman that is um, that is a figurative expression of an apostate church. <clears throat> so according to this, the term Babylon is quite broad. It refers to all uh, false or apostate religions, right? So not just uh, apostate Christianity. It refers to all of the other uh, world religions, uh, which are a perversion of the truth, um, or just blatant complete error, uh, and so yeah, so you've got some, um, you've got uh, corrupt churches and false or apostate religions in general. So um, <clears throat> in Revelation 17, uh, Babylon, I would say, refers primarily to the Catholic Church. When you look at the identifying marks or, or features that are given to describe this woman, this harlot, it, it, it fits best uh, the Catholic Church. But as we'll see later on, it also refers to other, uh, to the daughters uh, that are spoken of, as sh sh which uh, share the same name, which share the same characteristics. So um, uh, if, if I was again to, to say, uh, to repeat what I've said, to say it simply, in Revelation 17, we see a woman uh, with daughters. The woman's name is Babylon. She, it, being a woman it's, it's and, a, and a corrupt woman, it represents a corrupt church. The characteristics of that corrupt church fit most perfectly uh, the Catholic Church, uh, if you look at its history. But also the daughters, being the, you know, being the children of this woman, share the characteristics. They're similar to, in nature, to the mother, uh, Babylon. And that, that refers to the smaller, younger church, or well, the, rather the younger churches that came out of the Catholic Church, such and most famously as Lutheranism uh, and really all the evangelical and reformed churches. So, um, and then uh, in Revelation chapter 14, the, the, the verse that we just read, that I would say applies with, with greater force to the, um, to the Protestant churches to those churches I just mentioned. The ones who are referred to as the daughters in Revelation 17, I would say that the Revelation 14's mention of Babylon refers more specifically to the daughters, to the Protestant churches. Um, and there's a statement in, uh, the, I don't recall where it's found now, but it's, um, it's somewhere in my notes. Uh, it, it mentions that uh, Rome has always been fallen. It's been fallen for a long time. And this, this, that passage in Revelation 14 is, is mentioning the fall of Babylon as a recent event, uh, implying that at one point it wasn't fallen, at one point it was upright, and one, at one point it was in harmony with, with God. So again, in Revelation 17 refers primarily, Babylon refers primarily to the Catholic Church, uh, and, it, and, and then Revelation 14 primarily to the uh, Protestant churches. Um, and I've already explained this basically, but that it is fallen, that Babylon is fallen, refers primarily to its moral fall, to its departure from Christ 
Due to its embracing of pagan philosophies and practices, and especially its rejection of the truth, um, uh, in uh, the Great Controversy again, page 606, paragraph 2, it says, In amazement, they, that is, the members of these um, Protestant churches, hear the testimony that Babylon is the church, that is, the Protestant churches, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. So it's clear that the fall of Babylon refers to her, her immorality and her rejection of the truth. Um, okay, so it, again, to just, as I said, this is a brief review of what Babylon is. We could go into much greater detail, but I believe that last week a, a, good, a good job was done in explaining Babylon. So in simple, Babylon is primarily referring to the Roman Catholic Church. Secondarily, it refers to the churches coming out of the Roman Church, but who um, at some point rejected, um, they, they, they didn't continue to grow in their understanding of the truth. Eventually, they held to their creeds and they rejected um, advancing in the truth. The, this is referring to the apostate Protestant churches. And thirdly, it refers to the rest of the world's religions, such as Islam, Buddhism, and all other religions that have some confused view of God and the plan of salvation. Now, we must always remember that when we say this, um, the Bible in Revelation 18, there's a call to those who are in Babylon, and it says, come out of her, my people. And again, um, <clears throat> what this tells us is that while people may be in the system of confusion, they are still his people. That is, they are sincere followers of God based on the understanding of the truth that they have. So when we talk, when we explain these things, when, when I mention uh, that the Bible teaches that Roman, the Roman Catholic Church is, the, um, is Babylon, that Protestantism, much of Protest Protestantism today constitutes Babylon, that's Islam and all these other religions. This is not a denunciation of the people, of the individuals, rather of the systems of confusion in which they are in. So now that we've understood that, now that we know what Babylon is, what then is the wine of Babylon? That's the subject for this morning. What is the wine of Babylon? So one of the ways that we can understand this is just firstly getting a general understanding of how the Bible describes wine. So in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, this is a pretty well-known verse. It's kind of an unpopular verse, but <laughs> in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Now, there's a lot that could be said about this verse, especially as it applies to the literal consumption of alcohol. The Bible does not favor, uh, does not support the consumption of fermented, intoxicating wine. But there's a spiritual significance to this verse as well. You'll notice that in this verse, it says that wine is a mocker. What does that mean? <clears throat> that means that wine makes you a fool or it makes a fool of you. I remember in my days before I accepted Christ, I used to go to clubs and to parties, and I would see people that I looked up to, respected, uh, once they were under the influence of not that much wine or that not that much alcohol, they became fools, right? They would do things that they otherwise never would have done. They lost their senses. Their sense of judgment was completely uh, skew, uh, skewed. Their minds were foggy. They acted like idiots. Um, hate to say it, but that's what wine does to us. And um, since... Uh, Revelation is a symbolic book, it is a prophetic book. This is telling us something about this, uh, what is meant by wine. It, it does something, the wine of Babylon somehow affects the nations, it affects the minds of the nations, it makes fools out of them, and then it says, those who are deceived thereby. So how does it affect the minds? It confuses them and it deceives them, it leads them to experiencing deception. Now, We've said, have just said, that wine is a mocker. That is, wine makes a fool out of you. What does it mean to be a fool? Well, in simple, to be a fool is to, be, is to lack wisdom. So a fool is someone who does not have wisdom. What is the biblical definition of wisdom? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 2 to 6 says, or 2 and 6 rather, it says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Right. So what is being said here? That they are not to add or to diminish any of the commandments. They are not to alter the commandments, the Ten Commandments, in any way 
that they are to, to keep them. Then verse 6 says, Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Um, and we won't read the rest of the verse for now. So, what is this saying? What is their, What would be the wisdom of the children of Israel? It would be their adherence to the Ten Commandments, their obedience to the law of God. What is wisdom? It is obedience to the Ten Commandments. So foolishness, to be a fool, is the opposite of this. It is to lack, it is not to obey the Ten Commandments. In other words, if I put this together, what does wine do? It makes a fool out of you. What does that mean? It affects your adherence to the Ten Commandments. What does that mean? It leads you to uh, forget the law of God. So, um, let's, and this is this actually is why Proverbs chapter 31 verses 4 to 5 says as much. Uh, Proverbs 31 verses 4 to 5, it says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for the kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Then verse 5 says, Lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So what is wine? Well, wine is that which makes a fool out of you. Wine is that which deceives you. What does it mean that it makes a fool out of you? It means that it turns you from obedience to the law. It means it causes you to forget the law. Maybe it it leads you to not even know that there is a law or to have a a confused understanding of the law so that while you're thinking you're keeping it, you're actually breaking it. It makes a fool out of you. So um, now notice in Revelation 17, we see that Babylon is described, remember this is a woman, so in, uh, uh, Brother Loacho will look at Revelation 17 in much greater detail, so don't worry for now if we don't look at it uh, too much. But what we'll see uh, is that Revelation 17 has a picture of a woman sitting or riding on a beast. She's clothed in scarlet and purple, and she has a, uh, she has a cup in her hand. And I want you to notice what is inside this cup. Now remember, obviously... Uh, the wine would be in the cup. That's what generally what you would have in cups. You would either have water or wine in the Bible. And since we know from Revelation 14 that she has wine, then we see her with a cup in her hand. It's implied that what's inside the cup is, well, it's the, it's the wine. So notice how uh, Revelation 17 describes the contents of the cup. Revelation 17 verse 4 It says, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, now notice, full of what? Full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So this tells us something about the wine. This tells us that the wine of Babylon is associated with two things, with abominations and fornication. Now, putting this together with what we've learned about wine's symbolic meaning, this means that the wine of Babylon refers to that which deceives men into practicing abominations, which are ultimately a violation of God's law, and to them being involved in fornication. Okay, so now that we know this, what is an abomination? Since we know that um, this wine is directly connected and it likely leads to the involvement or the committing of abominations. What is an abomination? Um, since, uh, well, yeah, uh, I, I, I was about to read something, but I realized it wouldn't fit here. So let me look at, uh, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 25 and 26. Now I want you to notice, what is one definition of abomination? And by the way, there are many, uh, very many in the Bible, but we're only going to look at a few for this morning. Deuteronomy 7, verse 25 and 26, it says, The graven images of their gods, this is referring to the idols of the surrounding nations, in the land of Canaan, where Israel was about to uh, to, to conquer and to, to dwell in. It says, The graven images of their gods ye shall burn with fire. So what were they to do? They were to destroy these images. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. What, are the, what is an abomination to the Lord our God, to Israel's God, to our God? It is graven images. In other words, idolatry. Verse 26 says, Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. Uh, but thou shalt utterly detest it, and thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. So what is an abomination? Idolatry. 
the wine of Babylon includes deceptions that promote idolatry, that is, the worshipping of images. Uh, we indeed see that within the Roman Catholic Church, as well as in, uh, uh, within the Greek Orthodox Church and the Russian Orthodox Church and the Anglican Church, and actually in many other Protestant churches, well, I don't know if many, but I know of a, a, a few Protestant churches today which have actually began to bring images back into the church. This is idolatry. As much as people may try to excuse it, uh, they might try to dress it up in flowery words to, to make it not look like idolatry. It is idolatry. God condemns these things as idolatry. This is one of the, the, um, uh, the, the meanings of the word abomination. So what is, what is one aspect of the wine of Babylon? It is the promotion of idolatry, the teaching that promotes idolatry. <clears throat> That excuses it. Now, um, if we look at, again, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 12, we see another definition of idolatry. It's, uh, verse 9 says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So again, God was strictly uh, commanding Israel, do not learn from these nations. You have got nothing to learn from them. Don't try to copy them. Don't try to mimic them. We could learn from that today. Verse 10 says, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or to use divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. In one word, what are these abominations? Sorcery, right? There's witchcraft that is being involved with. This is all sorcery. And in First um, <clears throat> Samuel chapter 28, we see in the story where uh, King Saul uh, went and visited the witch of Endor to speak to Samuel, who had just recently died. We see that sorcery is connected with spiritualism. Spiritualism meaning uh, attempting to contact the dead, right? <clears throat> so... Um, that's actually what is meant by a consultor in, in, in our, the passage we just read in verse 11. It says the consultor with familiar spirits or a necromancer, right? Those were the ones who would uh, attempt to contact the, the dead, right? Now we know when we, when we read that story uh, that that was not actually the spirit of Samuel. Rather, it was the spirit of a demon, right? So um, what is my point? Abomin one aspect, another aspect, the second aspect uh, that we've considered of the meaning of abominations is spiritualism. Spiritualism and sorcery, which ultimately is an attempt to consult the dead. It's this, it's this idea that we can speak to the dead. It's this idea that the dead do not actually die, that they are immortal, right? Um, it's referred to as the natural immortality of the soul. This is a teaching of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, contrary to the plainest teachings of the Bible, which show that when a man dies, he has no more thoughts. His thoughts perish, right? Uh, his, he has no more action in, 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 in anything un, that is done under the sun. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes and in Psalms and in various places. Um, it's, the Catholic Church completely uh, contradicts that teaching that when a man dies, he continues um, in a conscious state, either going to what they call purgatory or limbo or up to heaven or down to hell, right? These are completely unbiblical teachings and they have very serious implications, right? We know that when uh, uh, King Saul consulted and spoke to this, um, this uh, spirit, he was eventually overwhelmed with discouragement and later committed suicide. There are very serious, practical, real-life dangers to embracing this this error that the the dead do not actually die right that you can contact the dead there we open ourselves up to serious deception uh, by believing these things <clears throat> and that is exactly what the devil is going to use at the end of time uh, in order to mislead multitudes away from being ready for the second coming so this has been this has been taught by the Catholic Church for centuries um, it, it has not only been taught by the Catholic Church, but it has been promulgated by the daughters of the Catholic Church, the Protestant churches. Essentially, none of them uh, forsook that, that teaching. They clung to this heresy 
And to this day, you cannot, you, if you go to any major Protestant church, you will find that they have this false and very dangerous uh, view, unbiblical view of the state of the dead, which I said opens the doors to all forms of spiritualism. So we've seen so far, what is one of the aspects of the wine of Babylon? What does it include? It includes <clears throat> um, idolatry, right? Which we saw has been fulfilled uh, lived out in the, the, the worshipping of images, which began uh, way back in, in the early um, early part of the first millennium, right? Not, not, not many uh, uh, centuries after the death of Christ. Um, even as early as the, the third and fourth century, idol that kind of image worship was already coming into the church. And, and, and finally, by, I would say, the, the, the fifth and the sixth centuries, it was already established and connected with that was the second um, idea of uh, aspect of abominations, which was this idea of saint worship, that when the saints die, you can still communicate with them, uh, right? So these, the wine of Babylon, really, uh, they're different elements, but they're all interconnected uh, to one another. So, um, um, there, there are two other ones that uh, we, I could refer to, but I won't go to them in detail now. The one is that um, really this idea of salvation by works, that you can be saved by what you do, by your own efforts, uh, that you, there is some way to merit your salvation. That is an abomination. Uh, also, the idea of the practice of uh, or the teaching of that you can eat unclean foods also is an abomination in the sight of God. Um, but... I want to go to um, the next one, which is found in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 9. Proverbs 28 and verse 9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. So what is an abomination in this verse? Well, if you look at it carefully, it's saying that someone who refuses to hear or to listen to or to heed or to obey the law of God, that, the Bible says, is an abomination. Right, but secondly, you'll see that you'll notice that what is this person doing? They're still praying, right? So, what is an abomination? It's this idea that you can approach God while breaking His law. You can come to God, you can receive His blessings while you are violating, you are transgressing the law of His government. And the Catholic Church, through its teachings, has deceived, has made a fool out of multitudes of people to turn away from the law by changing the law, right? Or rather by claiming that they had the right to change the law, particularly the Sabbath commandment, uh, which they transferred, uh, they transferred, they transferred, I'll, I'll put that like that, because they obviously didn't really do it, but they claimed to do it uh, in the 4th century. Um, and and it, it, that, that doctrine progressed and developed over time, but it, the, the roots of it can be found in the 4th century, in the time of Constantine, when he established the national uh, or, yeah, the national day of the sun, the, the venerable day of the sun, it was, as it was known back then. So uh, we also know that the, uh, to support its idolatrous practices, it altered uh, the second commandment, right? So um, <clears throat> well, or, uh, the, yeah, the commandment that refers to not worshipping graven images. So what we are seeing is that as we, are, as we are understanding more and more what these abominations are, is that this is clearly referring to false teachings that lead to a violation of God's law. This is what we are seeing, what we are understanding about the wine of Babylon. Now, I just spoke about um, the veneration of Sunday as a day of worship, right, uh, being included in this abomination. Well, there's a, there's a passage which really states this very clearly, that uh, uh, which condemns this this um, this false teaching, Ezekiel chapter eight verses fifteen to seventeen. This is um, Ezekiel is being given a tour through uh, the temple uh, um, in, in in his day in through the Hebrew the Jewish temple, and um, he is being shown the various abominations. Um, he's uh, being taken through uh, part of the different parts of the temple being shown the, 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 the wicked th deeds of the, of the people within the precincts of the temple. And once he's been shown several of them, verse 15 says, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. 
And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's temple. And behold, at the door of the temple, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. Now notice, what were they doing? They worshipped the sun towards the east. And, they, and then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and they have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put up the branch to their nose. <clears throat> so what are we seeing um, in this verse? What is the abomination? And really, when you read the, the, the chapter, this is the greatest of all the abominations that have been committed. The greatest of all these abominations is sun worship. So what is the part of the wine of Babylon? It's, it's a teaching that promotes sun worship. Now, Sunday worship today is really the modern equivalent of sun worship. Constantine appointed the pagan day of worship, the venerable day of the sun, as the new day of worship for all Christians within his empire. So, <clears throat> there is much more that we could consider when uh, talking about the wine of Babylon, but we've clearly seen uh, that the, this wine is referring to the false doctrines, the false teachings um, of the Catholic Church. Actually, I forgot to mention that um, that, that teaching, um, the, the teaching that the sacred uh, God's holy day has been transferred from uh, sa Saturday to Sunday, that teaching the, was also embraced, it was continued to be practiced by the Protestant churches and is to this very day. It was that fact that led to essentially the failure of the, of the European Protestants to, um, to further the, 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 the Reformation. The, there was, it was at the Council of Trent when the Catholic um, theologians basically exposed the, the, the hypocrisy of the, the Protestant churches and saying that they were going to live by the Bible and the Bible alone. They had departed, yes, from a number of the, the false teachings of a number of the different aspects of the wine of, 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 of the Catholic Church, uh, but the one that they clung to, which they did not forsake, was uh, the teaching of Sunday sacredness, right? This idea that Sunday now is the day of the Lord, that that is the day in which Christians should worship. And the, the, Christ, the Catholic theologians said quite simply that, well, your claim to live by the Bible and the Bible alone is false because we are the ones who were, were in their opinion, given the authority by God to change uh, Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. So by your adherence to the Sunday, you still are acknowledging our authority, right? So, and, and they never changed that, unfortunately. It was only in the 1840s that, um, uh, that uh, Christians really began to adhere to the Sabbath once again on, on a larger scale. There have been groups throughout history which, which clung to the Sabbath teachings, such as the Waldenses, and certain adherents throughout different denominations. Um, but by and large, today, there are only a few denominations, including the Adventist Church, who adhere to the Sabbath teaching. So, um, <clears throat> so going back to what I was saying previously, what we've seen is that the wine of Babylon, if, we, if I was to do a review wine, what does, what does wine do? It makes a fool out of you by deceiving you, right? And what does it mean to be a fool? Well, it means to it's the opposite of being wise. And what does it mean to be wise? Well, that means to, to keep the commandments of God, right? So it, in wine making a fool out of you, what it's actually doing is it's causing you to forget the law of God. It's causing you to break the law of God. It deceives you. It tricks you. It might even lead you to think that you're obeying the law of God, but you're actually breaking it, such as in the case of uh, Sunday sacredness, right? Many sincere Christians wholehearted Christians, sincere as any um, Adventist who, who keeps the true Sabbath, um, they, are, they have been deceived into thinking um, that that is true obedience to God, but it is not. It is a violation of God's plainest teachings. Um, <clears throat> so, and of course, God is, um, as, as we said, the people who have these, these uh, incorrect views of the Bible, they... Uh, the Bible says, my people, right? They are still God's people. They are still sincere. But um, their sincerity doesn't excuse the fact. It doesn't change the fact, rather. Let me say it like that. It doesn't change the fact 
that uh, this is wrong. This is this is heresy, and this is dangerous heresy as well, because any error opens up the door to some serious um, spiritual problems. So, um, if I was again to just uh, boil it all down, well, actually, um, let me continue. We see that I've just said that wine uh, deceives you; it makes a fool out of you; it leads you to forget the law of God. Um, and we've seen that in Revelation 17, the wine of of uh, of Babylon is associated with abominations and with fornication. So if we put those two ideas together, wine is that that thing which deceives you, it tricks your mind <clears throat> into uh, into falling into abominations, which really is a transgression, uh, different forms of transgressing God's law. And we've seen <clears throat> that among uh, these abominations, and there are many definitions of abominations, there is idolatry, right? There is uh, it is a there is a deceptive teaching in in uh, the, these fallen and uh, these fallen churches that uh, idolatry is acceptable, and they did this by altering the Ten Commandments. We've seen that um, it also refers to spiritualism. That is this false teaching that you can communicate with the dead, right? Um, that uh, that again is a is an aspect of this this wine. And it refers to uh, this idea that you can turn your ear away from the law. And that God will still hear you. It's this idea that grace kind of covers your um, your sins, that you don't actually have to adhere to the Ten Commandments anymore. Um, and again, as we said, we've seen this has been the teaching of the Catholic Church as well as of the many Protestant churches in various forms. It, it kind of manifests itself, that, that particular teaching, that you don't have to keep the law. It manifests itself in different ways and has done so throughout the centuries. But uh, in essence, you can find that teaching, you can find that theology throughout the fallen churches. And we, the last thing that we looked at is, is this idea of, of um, sun worship, right? Which we've seen that today, the modern equivalent is Sunday worship, right? It's as much, in God's sight, it is much, um, uh, it is essentially the same thing. I'll, I'll just put it like that. Um, now, again, that doesn't mean uh, that God... Uh, you know, he, he overlooks or he winks at those who are sincerely worshiping on Sunday. I'm not calling people who are uh, sincere Christians who worship on Sunday. I'm not calling them idolaters or, or wicked people. I'm just saying that this, uh, in the in God's sight, this is not pleasing. This is not a, in harmony with his teaching. Sunday has got nothing to do with the true purpose of the Lord's day. It's got nothing. It doesn't take our minds to creation. It doesn't take our minds to the sanctifying power of Jesus Christ. It doesn't do any of those things. Uh, and so it's a, it's a dangerous heresy. It, it takes away from the beauty of the holy day that God has given to us. So what is the wine of Babylon? It is false teaching. It is false doctrine. We find a clear statement on this in the book Evangelism, page 365, paragraph 1. It says, the fallen denominational churches are Babylon. We've seen that. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines, the wine of error. This wine of error is made up of false doctrines. Now notice, she actually lists some of these teachings. I didn't touch on all of them. It says, such as the natural immortality of the soul. We discussed that one. The eternal torment of the wicked. And those two are really connected with each other. The idea of eternal, this idea of burning in hell forever and ever and ever, is it can only exist as a doctrine uh, based on previous one, which is this idea that when you die, you continue in existence, right? You don't, your, your thoughts don't vanish. Uh, without without the, the teaching of the natural immortality of the soul, there could be no uh, doctrine of the eternal torment of the wicked. <clears throat> then she continues, says the denial of the pre-existence of Christ be, uh, prior to his birth in Bethlehem. So that, in other words, this this teaching that Jesus was created completely uh, at his incarnation. Uh, then it says, the advocating and exalting of the first day of the week above God's holy sanctified day. That is Sunday sacredness. We've touched on that already. These and kindred errors are presented to the world by the various churches. Um, so now what I want to end off with, right? We've seen clearly that the wine of Babylon is referring to the false doctrines of the church. Um what I want to end off is, how is it that these heresies, these false teachings, these false doctrines, became a part of the, the creed of so many churches? Uh, how is it that it came into to the, to the theology of the Catholic Church and of, of the Protestant churches of, of today? 
Notice this is found also in the Great Controversy, page 388, paragraph 2. It says, The great charge against the great sin charged against Babylon is that she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This cup of intoxication, which she presents to the world, presents the false doctrines, now notice, that she accepted, has accepted, as a result of her unlawful connection with the great ones of the earth. So, <clears throat> why did she, ex so, what's actually been shown us is that um, the, the, the church accepted false teachings, right? It knew that they were false, but it accepted them, and it says, as a result of her unlawful connection with the great ones of the earth. That is, the powerful people in the earth. In other words, the church had a, had a relationship with the powerful leadership of the church and uh, of the world. And in history, this happened to be the leaders of the Roman Empire, right? The, the emperors and the, the different magistrates and all those who had very powerful positions within the empire. Church leadership began to form alliances, which they should not have done. Uh, with them, but in order to maintain and to promote and to further that relationship, what did they do? Um, we're told that they accepted false teachings. The only way that that unlawful uh, relationship, which in the Bible is called fornication or sexual immorality, uh, the church departed from its faithfulness to God and instead chose another lover, which was the, the, the rulers of this world, and in order to do that, it accepted these false doctrines, which constitute the wine of Babylon. <clears throat> then it says, friendship with the world corrupts her faith, and in turn, she ex exerts a corrupting influence upon the world by teaching doctrines which are opposed to the plainest statements of Holy Writ. I really want to emphasize that. It's come to my mind repeatedly. You know, these doctrines, doctrine, it's not just a matter of, you know, being right or being wrong. These doctrines confuse, right? These doctrines bewilder. They, they, they literally, uh, they have serious negative consequences. The, the truth of the Sabbath, um, that's, it's not unimportant. Those are east, that's an essential doctrine to your salvation, right? The, the idea of having a correct understanding of the state of the dead, as I said to you before, has serious spiritual ramifications. Right. It also the correct teaching of the state of the dead also gives us a clearer understanding of the power of Jesus Christ, because what it shows us is that uh, death to, to Christ is but a sleep, something that he can just when he when he desires, he can just wake us up out of it. It shows the power of Christ, the power of him as, as the resurrection. Right. Um, so and we could go from one false doctrine to another, showing that these these false teachings Give us a skewed picture of who God is. And one of the most infamous of these, by the way, especially if you continue reading um, the great controversy, is the idea of eternal uh, torment of the wicked. It, that has led m multitudes of people to become literally insane. <clears throat> more, athe more atheists have been made out of that false doctrine than any other. Why? Because it shows God to be a cruel, corrupt, sadistic person. Uh, just evil, wicked being, right? That really, if you were to think about it, that kind of God, why would you want to be near a God like that? Right? You, you, you wouldn't, right? Uh, eternal hellfire, it, it, it makes God look worse than, than the, the, the most corrupt and evil uh, human tyrant that has ever lived. It makes Hitler look like a, a nice guy, right? When you really think about it, it's a, it's a horrible doctrine, right? And that's why um, it... It, uh, this title Babylon is given because it confuses the minds of people. It gives them a confused view of the character and of the nature of God. So it's very important that we understand this. But going back to what I was just reading, why? Uh, how did these doctrines come into the church? Was it because the church all of a sudden just forgot what the Bible meant? No, they knew that these doctrines were false, but they accepted these views so that they could gain position and power in the world right, through their connection with the leadership of the world. Now, the question is, is what is being referred to by this unlawful relationship or this friendship with the world? <clears throat> um, a few paragraphs later, right, in the same chapter in the Great Controversy, it explains the historical roots of this great apostasy as well as its present-day fulfillment. So it says, what was the origin of the great apostasy that is referring to these false doctrines coming into the church 
and the church departing from its obedience to God and to his law and to all his requirements. It says, how did the church first depart from the simplicity of the gospel? And then it gives you the answer by conforming to the practices of paganism to facilitate the acceptance of Christianity by the heathen. So what was it that led to these false doctrines coming into the church? It was a desire to be accepted by the heathen. It wasn't a desire to convert the heathen, to bring them into a savoring relationship with Christ. No, it was a desire to be accepted, to be popular, to be cool. Um, then it says, the apostle Paul declared even in his day, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Right. In other words, this was actually already happening in some ways, though in smaller ways, in the days of the apostle while he was still alive in the first century. And it says, during the lives of the apostles, the church remained comparatively pure, right? So while it was happening, overall, the church remained pure because of the presence of the apostles. But toward the latter end of the second century, most of the churches assumed a new form. So when did these false doctrines begin to really um, enter into the church? It tells us the latter end of the second century. Um, but notice it says, <clears throat> the first simplicity of the church that is, disappeared and insensibly as the old disciples retired to their graves that is once these uh, you know faithful uh, men leaders in the church died their children along with new converts came forward and new modeled or remodeled the cause so what happened the the disciples passed away then there was another generation of those who knew the the experience of the of the of the of that church age and they knew the truth. Um, they were continuing faithful for some time, but then they passed away. And then their children, the Bible says, and, and the converts that they won, they began to remodel the church. Um, it says, to secure converts, the exalted standard of the Christian faith was lowered. And as a result, a pagan flood flowing into the church carried with it its customs, practices, and idols. As the Christian church religion secured the favor and support of secular rulers, now that historically would refer to um, the, the, the time in history when Constantine allowed Christianity, legalized Christianity, right? When Christianity became the national religion of, Christian, uh, of, of the Roman Empire, um, it says it was nominally accepted by multitudes. But while in appearance Christians, many remained in substance pagans, especially worshipping <clears throat> in secret their idols. <clears throat> so what is this saying? This is saying that the generation that came after um, the, the children of these men who knew the, the disciples, they remodeled the church. What does that mean? It means that they lowered the standard of the Christian faith. What does that mean? They, they lowered the requirements. They changed the doctrines. They, they, they began to alter the teachings so that it would be easier for a pagan to become a Christian. In fact, they wouldn't even have to stop being a pagan. And the reason, the, the only way that they could do that was by altering the teachings of the church, which we have already seen. Uh, we've seen examples of that. The, the pagans who worship their statues and the images, uh, when, when the church altered its teaching on that, when it, altered, it, it brought in this heresy, that idolatry is, well, it's not, it's not actually idolatry, it's just respect, it's just reverence. Uh, that uh, allowed, and, and it was like opening uh, the, the, the gates wide and allowing, as it said, a, a flood of paganism to come into the church. Um, and it says that as a result, people nominally, in other words, they were not sincerely, truly converted, came into the church and the churches expanded rapidly, but not with genuine converts. Then it says, this is the, so this is referring to what happened to the Catholic Church. This is how uh, the, the Catholic Church embraced so many pagan rituals and teachings. It was to gain uh, favor and to grow in numbers. Uh, then it says, has not the same process been repeated in, uh, in nearly every church calling itself Protestant? As the founders, those who possess the true spirit of reform pass away, their descendants come forward and new model the cause in other words history is being was repeated in the protestant churches <clears throat> while blindly clinging to the creed of their fathers creed being a collection of of accepted um, doctrines the creed of their fathers and refusing to accept any truth in advance of what they saw so they said 
this is what uh, Martin Luther taught, and we are not going any further. This is all the truth that we need, right? This is what they were doing. The children of the reformers depart widely from their example of humility, self-denial, and renunciation of the world. So while Luther may have been wrong in some areas, he was a, a, he was a man who, ex, who manifested great humility, right? If you read, again, the great controversy, his story, you'll see that that man, uh, even though he had in, incredible in, intellectual uh, strength and ability, he was a humble man. He knew his need of the Lord. Self-denial, right? The, the reformers were truly willing to deny themselves. They were willing to give up their lives. And they renounced the world. They were not interested in worldly greatness. They were only interested in exalting Christ to, uh, to their nations, right? And the Bible says that this, uh, not the Bible, the great controversy says that this spirit was lost. It was lost by the descendants of these men. And in some cases, it didn't even take one generation to pass. And the zeal and the spirit of these men and their desire to know more truth was gone. They clung to, the, the, to, the, um, to their teachings and they were not willing to progress anymore. So <clears throat> what we learn from this, right, is that the... The, the wine of Babylon came into the church, came into, uh, it, it, it formed the foundation of the Catholic Church, and it, it entered into and, and completely corrupted the, the Protestant churches um, over time because of a desire to win the world's favor and because of a refusal to learn and to grow more, because of a lack of the spirit of humility and of self-denial and of a renunciation of the world, right? This, this shows us that simply um, having a strong intellect is not enough. This shows us that if we, if we ourselves who do know the truth, if we ourselves are not, um, if, if, um, if our goal is to, to conform to the world in any way, and that includes in our dress, in our diet, in our entertainment, in anything, in, if, if we are allowing worldliness to creep into our lives, we are actually opening ourselves up to being deceived and to drinking the wine of Babylon. If we are, um, <clears throat> if we are not willing to, to go further than, and, and to continue to, to have an open mind and to dig and to study and to investigate the scriptures for ourselves, not depending uh, alone on what other people have taught us, but truly uh, digging in the scriptures for ourselves, studying the Bible for ourselves. If we don't have that mentality... The, there are, there's a high chance that someday we could accept the wine of Babylon. And if we don't have the spirit of humility, of self-denial, of the, and of renunciation of the world that the reformers had, the men like Martin Luther, John Calvin, and, and John Wesley, and all these great men, if we do not have that spirit, that willingness to serve Christ regardless of the consequences, that desire to deny ourselves to the one who has given his life for us, if that is not our spirit, history tells us, that we will follow in the tracks of their children, that we will drink the wine of Babylon. We will not only drink it, but we will lead others to drink it as well. So, <clears throat> my friends, it, it is um, my urgent plea that for all of us, that we would guard ourselves from accepting these false teachings, that we would do so by, ex by um, placing Christ as first and as as um, foremost in our lives, devoting ourselves to his cause, to his truth, by being willing to study and to dig deep for ourselves, by embracing the spirit of the reformers with wholehearted service to his cause. It is my desire that as we commit ourselves, that we will be able to stand against the wine of Babylon, that we would rather take the wrath of Babylon than to drink its wine, that we would, we would forsake being involved in its fornication, in any of its abominations, in any of its heresies, in any of its immorality, that we would stick and cling and cleave to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the only one who can help us to have that experience. If that is your desire, if you desire to remain pure and true and to heed the everlasting gospel and to not be a part of Babylon, I ask that you pray with me as we end off. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for this time that you have given to us. We want to thank you, dear God, that 
you have made it plain to us that the wine of Babylon refers to the false teachings um, of these fallen denominational churches and of, of Catholicism, which in essence are really the teachings of paganism. Uh, dear God, these teachings which lead us away from our obedience to you, these teachings which cause us to forget your law, uh, these teachings which, which take us away from Jesus Christ. We want to commit our lives into your hands, Father, because we know, Lord, that we are no greater than these men who have fallen before us. It is only by your grace, dear God, that we will be able to resist the pressure to conform to the world. It is only by your grace, dear God, that we will be able to cling to the truth, Lord, uh, even if it means at the cost of our own lives. It is only by the power of Jesus Christ that we will be able to rise above all these trials and temptations and to be true to, to you and to him and to all heaven. So we ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit, that he will dwell in our hearts, that he will speak to us, and that you will help us, Lord, to be a part of that group that calls people out of Babylon to turn from these false teachings and to give them a clear view of your character, of your goodness, of your love, and of your saving power for all who believe in Jesus Christ. So we commit our lives into your hands, Father, and we thank you so much. And please be with um, Brother Luwajo as he continues to present. I believe he has two presentations today. Especially I pray that you'll bless him as he prepares for his study on Revelation 17. And help us, dear God, as we continue throughout the Sabbath day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, thank you uh, so much, everyone. And uh, as I said in my prayer, uh, you will want to tune in again at uh, 4 o'clock. Uh, Brother Lawaho will be giving a, an in-depth uh, study on the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 17, going into the fulfillment of uh, the prophecies of that chapter in our current day and how we can be ready for those events. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, God bless you.